What we're going to talk about this week over the course of the next couple of days together is what does the Holy Spirit in us actually want to produce in our lives? So, you know, we come to church, we read our Bible, we pray, we do all the, these things because we're after this relationship with Jesus, but, but what does it actually look like to be transformed into the image of Christ? What's the Holy Spirit doing in our lives? That's what we're going to talk about for the next couple of days. Um, and so tonight, uh, we have a special treat. Uh, my good friend, Pastor James Pope, is here uh, to begin this, uh, this week of camp together. Um, so when he comes up here in just a moment, you guys make sure to welcome him uh, with a big, warm welcome. Uh, and then pay attention, listen well, because um, he's got it on video. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure he said something about like sending it to straight to heaven or something. So, you know, Jesus can like check and see who was paying attention at church on a Wednesday night. I'm just saying, I, I don't know. Is that what's, is that? Right, something like that, something like that. So, hey, we're glad you're here. It's gonna be a great week together. I'm gonna pray, um, then Pastor James is gonna come up and share with us tonight. Father, we're grateful to be in your house. We're grateful to have the chance to worship you, to open your word together, um, to know that you do invite us uh, with the faith that we have, the, the trust in you to come into your presence and to be, to be transformed by the power of your spirit in us. And, and God, our prayer is that this week over the course of the next 48 hours together, um, that lives and hearts would be transformed, that you would be lifted up. And that as uh, we lift up your name, God, draw us to yourself. Make us more like Jesus as we talk about uh, your word and, and in, in groups together. So Father, uh, tonight our hearts, our, our lives are open to you. This time belongs to you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Hey, you guys, welcome Pastor James to the front. Don't get too far away. <laughs> All right, first order of business is because this is not just on camera for video. This, this goes out to my ministry webpage, and so people all around the world are going to get to see this. But I want them to see who I'm getting to share with this evening. So stand up, turn around, face the camera, and give it a howdy doody. That was pretty weak, but we'll let it slide. It's, I, I know you don't know me, and I don't know you yet. And when it's all said and done, we both be, be glad, glad that that's the case. Now, I don't know what you call James here in his staff position, but because we're both Jameses, uh, there needs to be some way to sort of distinguish between uh, the two of us so when you call out, we'll know who you're talking to. And in the New Testament, there were actually two Jameses as well. You know that? There were two Jameses. And you know how theologians have distinguished those two. He gave them nicknames to describe who they were. You know what those were? There was James the Elder and James the... The less, thank you, thank you. So evidently, I am James the Elder. Uh, I, I can't help that. I am the older one. So that leaves it to James to be James the less, unless you just want to call him Jimmy, and that'll be okay by me too. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be with you. Um, I want to show you a video clip. Uh, we're going to do this in two parts. We're, the first part is just going to be sort of an introduction, and we're going to stop. Now, if by chance you have seen this on social media, don't give it away, please. Because this is a part of the exercise this evening in our learning process together about what the Spirit wants to do in your life about this particular subject matter. So roll the video clip and then stop it at the right place. All right. She ran her shoe. All right. Now let me sort of set this up for you. How many of you have seen this? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're, we're in good shape here. All right. The man who shot this video, or his family shot this video, is, is named Bud Crawford. And Bud Crawford is a professional boxer. He's 34 years of age. He's five foot eight, which is just a little shorter than I am, but he has the reach of somebody who's six foot two. You, you got that? So this is a, 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 not a big guy, not a wide guy. He, he, he fights in the welterweight, light welterweight division. He has won all four titles and combined those. He has had 39 fights. He has lost none, 29 by knockout. So it's this man's seven-year-old daughter by the name of Talia that is in this race. And what has happened is when the gun sounds and she starts right out of the chute, she loses a shoe. All right, now here's the test question, and I, I want feedback from you, legitimate, honest feedback. Now, if, do we, how many athletes do we have in here? Come on. You, uh, all right, all right, so if, even if you're not an athlete, you can, you can participate in this exercise. So if this is you, 
You're in a 200 meter race. You get out of the box and you lose your shoe. What do you do? Forget about it. Keep running. All right. All right. All right. Okay, so we, we need to have some honest f feedback here. And I have a daughter. I, I, have a, I have a daughter that's probably as old as James. I hate to say that. But anyway, and my, my daughter was, is an athlete. She was a gymnast. Um, she, she was picked to be a Baltimore Ravens cheerleader, but she turned them down. I, I told her the only way she could do that is if she wore her Dallas Cowboy uh, underwear when she did that. But she, she, so she went and she cheered for the Baltimore Blast soccer team. So I, our daughter, um, she's me made over just in the feminine version. She is highly competitive. And when my daughter, when things go wrong for her, you know how she responds? She responds by getting angry and cries. Now, now all right, is there anybody here who would honestly say if you blew your shoe off out of the blocks and everybody else is leaving you, you would just want to sit down and go, what the heck? Why keep trying? Anybody want to admit that? All right. Well, now let's, let's watch the rest of this because this forms the definition for our subject matter tonight. So, and, and I love the fact that the family members are around this camera and they're screaming their lungs out at her. So watch the rest of this. Go to Layla. Go Layla. Go Layla. <laughs> now, I, I want to say she did that just to quiet her family down because they had to be an embarrassment to her, screaming like they were at her. But is that not the most astounding thing you've seen in a long time? If, if she had lined up and, and the rest of the runners had said, listen, spot us 50 meters and then we'll start, she would have said, you're crazy. There's no way. Get out of the blocks, lose her shoe. She doesn't keep running. That's what I think. Just run with one shoe on. You know, you'd probably run in sideways, but run with one shoe. No, she stopped, went back, put her shoe on, and resumed the race and won it. Hands down. Now listen to what her dad said. He said, I just can't stop talking about my daughter's track meet yesterday. He said, she doesn't uh, have a clue how much she just motivated me. This is the definition of not giving up, heart and grit. She let it all hang out when she was hit with adversity. And I go, good for her. Now, I wouldn't want to meet her in a track meet under fair conditions. She's seven years old, and she so showed grit like that. So, uh, two weeks ago, uh, when James finally got around to, he, he invited me to speak at this event some months back. And I agreed to do it, and I said, well, what would you like for me to talk about? He said, I don't care. Talk about whatever you want to. And I don't like that. I like to have a target to shoot at. And so I'm, I'm working on something. I said, I've got something great I'm going to share. So a week ago last Sunday, on the way into church, he stopped me. He said, I've got your subject matter. It's perseverance. And I thought, okay. I went into the service. I didn't hear a word that Pastor Randy said that whole service. You know why? I was thinking about perseverance and what we were going to do tonight. The definition of perseverance. Well, it'd be interesting to see what some of you think it is. Anybody have a, a definition of perseverance? Keep going. Keep going. I like that. Never giving up. Okay. All right, now, the word that appears, and, and I'm going to have James come up, and he's going to be the voice of God. He's going to read Scripture for us tonight. Um, the word that we find in the New Testament that's translated perseverance is actually made up of two Greek words where they were combined. The, 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 the Greek word is hupomone. The first part of that, hup, hupo, is, is where we get our English word hypo. 
It's like, you know what a hypodermic is? What does hypo mean? Hypo means what? Under. So a hypodermic means it goes under what? Dermis is the skin. So any English word that has hypo or hyper in the beginning of it means it's under. The other part of that word is to remain. So the, the word that's translated in the passage that he's about to read, and I'm not sure what, what version you're going to get, and I'll explain just a minute why it's a little confusing, but the places that the translators do a good job and you put the word perseverance in there. This is the word that they use that means to remain under. And you're going, well now how does that make translate into perseverance? So read our two passages, whichever order, James 5, 1, 1 through, one, oh no, 2 and 3 and then verse 12, and then Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. James chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. All right. Now, this translator, I'm not sure what version that is, but translates the word as steadfastness. Now, the rest of that passage we don't like because this, this James <laughs> in the New Testament is saying, listen, when things go south on you, be happy about that. Be joyful because God is using difficult circumstances to grow you in your faith relationship with God. And out of difficulties is produced what steadfastness, and the word there is our word for perseverance. Now read the passage out of Romans chapter 5. Just verse 3. You said uh, right. Verses 1 through 5. 1 through 5. 1 yeah. through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. All right, thank you, thank you. Give, give James a good hand, he read that so, so very well. You, you know, these, these New Testament writers, Paul included, that wrote, wrote Romans here, they don't help us out at all quite often. You know, here's James is saying, when it goes bad, rejoice! God's really doing something good in you. But it only works if perseverance is a part of our experience. If we're to lay it and, and things go wrong and the shoe comes off, and then what do we do? Do we stay the course? Not just to finish it, but to win it. And then Paul comes in, in, in Romans chapter 5 and he said, listen, this is what God has done for you. He's demonstrated his grace. He's forgiven you. He's given you purpose and hope and all those things. But while we're at it, just know that when stuff goes wrong, God is at work in you to produce perseverance, to be able to remain under. Now, there are other ways I... I, I, I Tried to think of some synonyms. Some, the definitions some of you gave were good ones. These are ones I came up with. My first one is actually, I don't think it's a word. It's called stick to itiveness. You heard that before? Now you have. You can't say that anymore. Uh, or staying the course, or never quitting, or tenacious, or in some case, just plain stubbornness. Now, my question is as, as we try to refine this into a context of spiritual values, because that's, that's what we're here for. You know, I have some other examples from life in general, from history, about people who have persevered and, and we all have benefited from their perseverance. But in terms of us, I, I got to wondering, when we, when we think about this in terms of remaining something under something, what are those somethings that we can be under that aren't easy, that when we remain faithful to what God has called us to, then he produces his best work in us. What are the things that we can be under? What are the things that you have been under? Pressure. pressure. Okay, what kind of pressure? Pure. Peer pressure. And that's not the thing you fish off of either, is it? That's a different kind of pressure. Okay, peer pressure. No, that's good. Somebody else? <laughs> Parental pressure. Oh, that's a good one. Parental, that's tough. Parental pressure. Obligations are responsibility. That only works if you're a responsible person is that pressure, doesn't it? Internal pressure. Internal. You're not talking about like gas or anything, are you? 
Just in your mind? Yes. Okay. Okay. How about, how about the pressure of expectation? You deal with that? Um, there are other kind of pressures. Now, when I think of pressure, I think about a load that we're under. And so I'm, I'm trying to contextualize for myself this whole concept in the New Testament that James writes about and that Paul writes about. And so, well, how do we factor that into our lives so that the, the net result is the Spirit's work in us that we have, in fact, persevered? So it, it is those circumstances in life. We'll say the things that we can be under is those circumstances in life that we don't ask for, that we don't dictate, that we don't plan, that we don't schedule, but that we inherit. And they come to bear on us. And the question is, what do we do when that happens? Anybody know the name of Chester Carlson? Does that name ring a bell? Okay. Uh, Chester Carlson was a man that, uh, he actually lived until 1968. He was an engineer. He was a very smart guy. And back during the Depression, almost 100 years ago, uh, he was in a shop as an engineer. And, and, and back then, in order to make duplicate cop copies of anything, they, they had to take a picture, a photographic picture. And there were no instant of anything back then. It involved a nasty chemical process to make these duplicates. And he said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And he hired a German engineer to come over, and I think he paid him $10 a month back then. He said, we've got to figure out some way to do this. I think there's a way to do this. And they studied this process called electrostatic copying. And they spent a number of years developing this until they figured out how to make it happen. And so he took his idea and he patented it. And then he took it around to companies to try to sell them. He took an amber rod, he took a piece of, of sheep's wool, he took some, some black powder, and a piece of white paper and a piece of glass. And he went in and he demonstrated this to these, these company owners. He would rub that amber rod on that wool. And you know what that does? It, it's what you do when you rub a balloon on your hair. We call, call that what? Static electricity. And he took that and he, and, he, and he put some black powder on the glass. He took that rod and he touched that and then he, he laid that over a picture, over a piece of paper that had that powder on it. And then he took it and he shook all that powder off and the electric static of that amber rod on that paper caused that black powder to stick on that paper. He had invented the Xerox copying process. And you know what that company owner did? Showed him the door. Said there's no practical use for that. You know how many times he did that? 20 times he was shown the door and said we don't have any use for that. Well, I think living now today, if you have a laser printer <laughs> in your home, you are a beneficiary of somebody who, what, persevered through difficulties. I mean, I can think of some other good examples for sports people, especially if you like the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, even if you don't like the Dallas Cowboys, boo, that wakes you up. In 1990, 1994, January the 2nd, the Dallas Cowboys were playing the New York Giants in Meadowland. They were in the playoffs and hoping to go all the way. And it was in that game that Emmett Smith, who, who holds the rushing title, we know that, suffered a shoulder separation in the second quarter. Anybody here had one of those? Shoulder separation? You know how painful that is? It's terribly painful. They, they took him in right before halftime, two minutes worked on him, worked on him all during halftime, and for most ball players, the game would be over. Emmett says, no, my team needs me. And he came back out in the, in the third quarter, and he told the coach, he said, don't put me in if you're not going to give me the ball. <laughs> he told his lineman, he said, just don't let him hit me. He played the rest of the game. He ran 168 yards, caught 10 passes, scored a touchdown, and Dallas Cowboys went on to win the Super Bowl that year. Now, it's been that long since they won that, but that was, that was tenacity on his part. That was steadfastness. He was under enormous duress. There's something else to be under. And yet he, he, he bore up under that, and the fruit was, he said, I didn't run for myself. He said, I remember when I was six or seven years old, my brother says, you can't play the game if you can't play in pain. And he said, and I told myself that through the whole of the game. So let's, let's bring this into to, to principles here. Um, <laughs> there's so many other things. Strength and endurance. Um, all right, so here's, here's a riddle for you. What do water and electricity and running backs all have in common? They all move. Okay, that's good. Got any physics people in here? They all what? They all face resistance. You're in the right neighborhood. 
They all seek the path of the least resistance. Electricity, water, and running backs. When Paul writes about perseverance, when James writes about perseverance, that is not what he's writing about. He's not talking about a believer who says, I believe in God, I know Jesus Christ, I have the Spirit, but I'm going to take the easy road whenever I can get it. It simply says, this is the reality that I didn't find for myself. I didn't create this environment. It's simply where I am and who I am. And the question is, am I going to what? Remain under that so God reveals himself in us. That for, for the Apostle Paul, when, when you read about his journey in 2 Corinthians, when he's defending his apostleship to that, that group of believers in a very pagan country, he said, for those who think they're super saints and, and, and know God better than I do, he said, this is the cost it's, it's paid, it, that I've had to pay to be this. He said, I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned and left for dead. I've been whipped. I've been beaten. I've suffered at the hands of my friends and my enemies and countrymen. And he said, and I what? I stayed the course. And God used him to write 13 of the letters in the New Testament that we have in our hands even now. Paul was one that understood the cost of what? Persevering that God might do his best work in him. Now, I thought about, and, and I wasn't sh really sure how we could work into this, but you're all familiar with the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis? Y you familiar with that story? So, Gen so, so Joseph was, he was, yeah, he had, a, he had a bunch of brothers, and he was a brat. Would we agree on that? He, he liked telling on his brothers. Um, he had dreams that God was revealing something, but he took great pride in telling his family about his dreams. It didn't go well, and so what did his brothers do to him when he was 17 years of age? They beat him up, threw him well, and then sold him into slavery as a caravan was coming through. And they took his coat of many covers, and what did they do with it? They put blood on it. And they took it back to daddy, and what did they tell daddy? An animal ate our brother. Ain't it sad? So what happened to Joseph? The caravan took him to Egypt and he was sold to somebody in Egypt. You remember who, who bought him? Potiphar. And who was Potiphar? He was an official in Pharaoh's court. And so Joseph worked in Potiphar's house. And that's, that's better than being a slave out digging ditches, would you say? It, it, was, it was a pretty high you know, position for him to be in. So what happened when he's in this great position one day? Uh, Potiphar's wife had designs on him. Is that safe to say? She liked his bod. And one day he went in, she sent all the other servants out, and she tried to put the move on him. And he left so quickly, he did what? He left his outer cloak behind in her hand. He's like, get the heck out of Dodge. She was so offended by the fact that he had turned her away that when Potiphar came home, what did she do? She lied and said Joseph had tried to put a move on her. Absolutely. And that's a nice way to put it. And so Potiphar blew a gasket and did what to Joseph? Put him into a dungeon, into a prison. He stayed in there for a number of years until a couple of, of, of Pharaoh's servants, a baker and a wine taster, offended him and they got thrown in the same jail. And they had dreams while they were in there. And then they didn't know what those dreams meant. And so somebody said, hey, Joseph can interpret those dreams. And so they went to him and they said, well, tell us about these dreams. And so one of them, he said, well, this is after three days and you're, you're going to be restored. And the other guy thought, that's good news. What does my dream mean? In three days, you're going to lose your head. What? Uh, can I get a second uh, in, in interpretation of that, reading that? And he said, please remember me to Pharaoh when you get out of here. Did they remember him? No, they did not. Sometime later, I believe it was the baker, remembered his promise to Joseph. Pharaoh had a dream. He had a dream about cows and corn and Stephen King kind of stuff. And, uh, 
And all the, the, the wise men in, in Egypt couldn't interpret those for him. And that's when it came back to that, that servant who said, Oh, man, I knew I forgot something. There's a guy down in the dungeon who can interpret dreams. And so he brought him out and he interpreted the dream. He said, Oh, yeah, that, that's a, a picture of the future. There's going to be seven abundant years. And then there are going to be seven lean years that eat up those seven years' abundance, and there's not going to be food for anybody. And Pharaoh said, what should I do? He said, well, you need to get somebody to take charge of the years of bounty. When the crops are coming in and everything is, is, is good times, and you ought to be putting that in, into store, building barns and silos and things, to put all that stuff in so you'll have food to survive the, the lean years and... And Pharaoh said, well, who can I find that's wiser than you are? And Pharaoh picked him up out of the dungeon and gave him that position in his empire. You know how long it was between age of 17 and when he assumed that position? It was 13 years. 13 years. Seven years later, after the good years have gone by, the famine is not just in Egypt, it's, it's in all the Middle East that his brothers are back in Canaan. And the dad says, we're hungry, I hear there's food in Egypt. Y'all go down and bring us some food back here. And his brothers go down to Egypt, and guess who they have to go to for their food? Joseph. It's been 20 years now since they sold him into slavery. He's speaking Egyptian. He has a really good tan from being in that part of the country. They don't recognize him. But he knows them. You know the rest of the story. He sort of plays cat and mouse with them for a little while, and he eventually reveals himself to them. And they have a happy reunion. You remember what he said to them? I believe it's in chapter 50. He said, listen, you meant evil to me when you did what you did, but God meant it for the good to bring about this present result to save a lot of people. You know, the only way that Joseph could have been the man in that moment, in that time, that God would use to save his own family, his own brothers, his own dad, and all the, and all the rest of the people in the Middle East, was because what? He persevered under the worst of condition, and he maintained what? His integrity and his courage and his purity, because that's what he was called to do as a child and a descendant of Abraham who had this faith relationship with God. So, so how do we translate, how do we put that into a context for us here? That, you know, Galatians, um, I love this. In, in Galatians chapter 5, we have what? We have the fruit of the Spirit. And, wh and what are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Okay, all right. Now, now, the word patience there. Now, see the translators, when, when James the last read our other passages... Sometimes a translator will translate that same word that we had as patience. But there's actually a different Greek word that means patience. In Galatians, Paul doesn't use the first word to remain under. He uses the word for long-suffering. And he says that this is a, what? A fruit of the Spirit. Now, what's a, what's a spiritual fruit? A spiritual fruit is something that what the Spirit does in us that produces something in our lives, not the result of our effort. It's like, have you ever seen an apple tree strain to produce apples? Have you ever seen a peach tree strain to produce peach? They produce those because why? It's in their nature to produce those things. Spiritual fruit are those things that God does in us by the Spirit of God. And, he and so, for those of you, I know you, you've never done this, but your parents and your grandparents have. They have said, I'm never going to pay for, pray for patience because patience is what produces long-suffering. Tribulation works patience. So I'm not going to pray for patience because I don't want tribulation. You heard that before? I got news for you. You don't have to pray for it because it's a gift of the Spirit. God's going to do it to you anyway whether you ask for it or not. God is wanting to produce in you patience or long-suffering. But when you look over in, the, in the, the letter of Peter, Peter talks about those attributes that a believer needs to add in their life to their component of faith. He says, and add to your faith and he has that list of things. Anybody know what those are? 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. Come on, voice of God, read that to us. <coughs> Verse 
For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The spiritual fruit of patience, the Spirit's going to do in us whether you ask Him to do it or not. Long-suffering or perseverance or steadfastness, it's translated, is something that we have the responsibility for when Peter says, you need to add to your faith these things. And the only way they get added is if you do what you need to do so that it becomes true for you. So whatever you are under in your life, in whatever context, in whatever company, the way for that, for perseverance to be born in you is for you to remain true to what your purpose, your objectives, your calling, your spiritual principles, knowing that in due time God is going to bless you and provide what you need in ways that you cannot imagine. More times than not, perseverance, steadfastness is not God working in difficult circumstances for us. It's our simply waiting on the timing of God to do what He alone can do when we're willing to wait for Him to do that. I want to end with this story. I have to tell this. I, 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 you know, when you're old, you, you got lots of stories. I have lots of stories. So I, I pastored in Maryland uh, for, for 27 years. I planted a church, stayed there for 24 years. And in 19, I mean, in 2003, we bought a shopping center. We'd run out of places to rent and meet, and so we bought a shopping center. And it was one of those little strip malls. It had about, you know, six or eight stores in there. And it was an older neighborhood right on the main drag going into town. And as we were out there working on this thing, there was a lady that lived in that community that over the, matter of fact, they used to drive through the parking lot as a shortcut, okay? And, and she saw this and, you know, she was curious about who we were. And so when she discovered that we were a church and she didn't know what kind of church we were, and she didn't know if we were on the snake handling, Kool-Aid drinking, you know, kind of things, that, that she, she asked her son to bring her to church one Sunday when we were open for business. And, um, and, and uh, she did. So, so Scott and his, and his mom, they came to church. Well, she was a believer, had just not been serving God for a long time. And so she became a part of our church, and she was happy. She had a, a husband who was a, he was a pagan. He was a retired rail, railroad worker, just tough as they could be. His name Alvin. And uh, she tried to get Alvin to come, and Alvin really wasn't interested. And Scott came with her, some. Scott is... He's in, his, his, um, he's in his early 60s now. And he came with her for a while. We became friends. And he would come on and off, on and off. And, and Scotty, um, he loved playing the horses. So anytime there was a horse race, whether it was a Preakness or whatever it was, he, he'd always have a bunch of people over to his house and have a cookout and watch the horse race. And on Preakness weekend, he'd buy tickets for everybody. So, you know, if your horse won, then you got to win whatever the, the stake was. And he, so he invited my wife and I to this, this party. And so we went over. I was glad because there were some people I knew and there were other people I did not know. And his dad was there. And his dad pulled him aside and said, Scotty, he said, you're making a mistake. You, you shouldn't mix your company like this. That means mixing the preacher with these other people that aren't preachers. Let's just leave it at that. And, but I was, I was honored to be there. My wife and I, you know, we just had a great time. The food was terrific. Our horse didn't win, but that was okay. So that was our relationship for a number of years. Scotty also loved, Scotty, if you see this, I love you still. I'm, I'm just telling your story. Um, he also loved to play the slots. And casinos had opened, you know, down the road from us. And, and so he went out one time and he played the slots. And I think he won $30,000. And I saw him the next Sunday and he had a cap on and he was talking about, you know, his winnings. I said, Scotty, don't, for, don't forget God <laughs> in your celebration. Well, he got offended at that. And he quit coming. And so I didn't see him for a while. It was hit and miss, you know, come and go, come and go. Well, I retired. I, no, some, sometime later after that, his dad started coming to church. And, uh, and I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with his dad and seeing his dad pray to receive Jesus Christ. I retired in 2017. Scotty had just sort of disappeared. He was still around. You know, we still had friends. And I moved to South Carolina. And, uh, and because of ministry needs, I finally joined the Facebook community. I was a holdout against that. Forgive me for that. But, you know, it, it was what it was. And so I got online, and I knew there would people be looking for him. Well, well Scotty po popped up on Facebook. And so I reached out and, you know, we became friends. And so we sort of reestablished contact. And, and it was just friendly at arm's length relationship. 
And then sometime uh, toward the end of last year, I noticed that, that, that Scotty was posting, he had had some health issues, he was posting that, that he was going back to church. He was looking for somebody to go to church for him, with him. And so I, I, I wrote him, I said, listen, I want to commend you that you're, you're resuming your spiritual search. And he wrote back, he said, Pastor James, it began with you. I went, well, I thank you, I appreciate that. So months went by and we continued to exchange. And then in, I think it was, it was February this year, uh, he wrote me, he said, uh, Pastor James, he said, I'm, I'm going to be making a trip to Florida, I'm coming through your way, can I stop and see you? Oh, absolutely, Scotty, I can do that. And so he came through, took us to dinner. He likes to eat. I'm glad for that. I got to show him the area. And, um, and then he, he spent the night with us. And the next day he, he made his way on down to Florida to see some other mutual friends. And then on his way back, he stopped in to spend some time with us again. And, and this, I, I was praying about what God wanted to do because I'm trying to practice this what? This perseverance. Waiting on God. I have this burden. Everyone that I meet and build a relationship with, I want to know how Jesus is going to reach them. And I want to be his instrument for doing that. And I'm willing to wait on the Spirit of God to lead me to do that. That's perseverance. So that next morning, Scotty gets up. We're having coffee in the living room, and, and he's getting ready to head back up the road. And I went in to sit down and said, Scotty, I said, there's something I would like to do for you. And he said, what's that? I said, I'd like to do for you what I did for your dad. He said, what's that? I said, I got to pray with him when he made his commitment of faith to Jesus Christ. And you know what Scotty said? I would like to do that. That morning in my living room, we prayed and Scotty made a commitment of his life to Jesus Christ. If you wait on God, if you remain faithful to God's calling to you under whatever the, the circumstances and the situation is, God can and will use you and bless you. And the Spirit will make you an instrument of his peace in your world, in your peer group, with your parents, with your family, with your friends, with everyone in your life, you can be an instrument of God's peace if you let the power of perseverance and the Holy Spirit take hold of your life. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this time. Um, I thank you for this, this group of young adults as they're making their way in life and trying to discover who they are and, and the fact that they're participating in these events this week because they, they have a desire to, to learn more and to grow more and wherever they are individually in that journey that your spirit would meet them in this moment and encourage them that they can and do things that they couldn't even imagine before that if they're willing to be faithful to you be faithful to what is true and pure and holy and right listen to the voice of your spirit then you will use them as an instrument of your peace and lives will be changed because of them. I commend them to you and the work of your spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and for his sake. Amen.